church. It is Zoe and Megan. And we are so <laughs> excited to be welcoming you to church today. Yes, we want to give a huge shout out and welcome to everyone who's joined us on our YouTube channel yeah. or on Facebook. We're so glad that you're tuning in today. And we'd love to encourage you to jump onto another device at hopeyousee.tv where there is a chat live active right now right now our team are busy typing in wanting to welcome you wanting to connect with you so why don't you jump out onto that other device and join in on all the fun <laughs> awesome and we would actually love to take this time to pray together today over yes. any needs we may have in the church and mm. some praise and prayer reports that have been sent in this week yeah so Another praise report has been sent in of a lady who has been defying all oncologist reports in her cancer journey, which wow. is absolutely amazing Hallelujah. to hear. Yes. yes, thank you, Jesus, for that. Mm. Um, our prayer reports this week are for a family who is going through a cancer journey and needs strength, peace, courage. So we'll be praying for yeah. a miracle for thank them. You, Jesus. We are believing for provision of finance and an opportunity for a project, mm. speaking courage and determination over a person in rehab after yeah. an accident. And we'll be praying for an elderly lady to help find her a new home. Yeah. Megan, would you like to pray Beautiful. for these for us? I would love to. Come on, church. Why don't you lean in right now and join your faith with ours as we lift up these prayer requests to our God. Father, I just thank you so much that what we're hearing and learning about in your word at the moment is that you are an unshakable God and yes, we actually yeah. are able to stand unshakable in you, Father, even through storms, even through the valley. When we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I thank you, Lord, that you are with us. You yeah. are for us and we can stand confident and trust in you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. I thank you that you are a trustworthy God and I pray for these needs. I pray for these people that are calling out to you, Father. I pray that you would strengthen their trust in you today, Lord, that you would give them courage. You would give them strength. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with them and empowering them to continue walking. And we just declare miracles in every life, in every heart. We thank you for that praise report of that lady journeying yes. in cancer, God. We just speak more miracles over the lives of your people for your glory and for your name to be lifted up. And I just want to thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of your word, that you hear every prayer, you hear every heart cry. And I thank you that you are listening to us right now. And more than that, you are working and moving on our behalf. We love you and we give you praise and all the glory, Father, to your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is so good. <laughs> so good. And our online team are also very ready to pray and chat yes. with you for any prayer requests that you may have. Mm -hmm. So click the prayer prayer Link button the in the chat yeah. below yeah. and our team will be right there ready to pray with you. Yes. Or you can email us at talktous at hopeyousee.com. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to gather together and praise and worship God.
Hi, my name is Bruce Roberts and I'm part of the Hope You See team and just want to welcome you to our online service today. The generation before the baby boomers used to say, there are three topics we must avoid in all conversation. If you want to have polite society, you must avoid these conversation topics. One, number one, never discuss politics. Number two, never talk about money. And number three, never talk about sex. But in our current generation and media, we seem to hear about nothing else. It's a good thing then that scripture has a great deal to say about these issues and especially about sexuality and sexual temptation. The world around us has this so-called enlightened view about sex and sexual activity. But why don't we take time to examine that a little more closely? See, my friends and the world around me says this, my sex life, my sexual ethics are my business and no one else's, right? Or my generation said, if it feels good, do it, right? Or it doesn't matter what I do as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, right? Or lately it's, I'm into casual relationships. I have an open marriage, no long-term commitments, no obligations, just being free. And often I will hear, oh, you religious people, you have an antiquated view of sex and your traditions have no place in our modern, sophisticated world. But there's a fundamental problem with that rhetoric. You see, it starts with the idea of creation. If God really did design you, then it stands to reason that he also designed your sexuality. He designed your your whole sexual identity. And maybe he can help us to understand that. There's no doubt that every person has been created as a sexual being. And each one of us needs to learn how to interpret our sexual identity into the way we actually live. By contrast to these obviously failed worldviews about sexual ethics mentioned above, as believers, we want to have an unshakable conviction about what really works when it comes to any form of sexuality, any form of temptation, and especially our whole world of sexual ethics. The world speaks a lot about love, but often they just mean what I would say the Bible calls lust, the desire for self-gratification and pleasure, and it's often at the expense of someone else. But love, love is something different. Love is a selfless giving for the benefit of others. Let's check out what the Apostle Paul wanted to teach the young believers in Thessalonica. The first point is this, he wanted them to overcome sexual sin. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we've taught you. You live this way already and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember what we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin then each one of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who don't know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife. For the Lord avenges all such sins as we have solemnly warned you before. Wow. It's a confronting section of scripture. And the Apostle Paul, we must remember, had had given away a great deal in order to pursue the holiness and the the sense of, of sexual purity that God asked of him. Why don't we take a moment to consider the culture and customs of the region that he's speaking to? We have to remember that the ancient Greek, the ancient Roman, and even the Macedonian worlds were in many ways not unlike our own culture culture currently around sexual behavior and expectations. In fact, sexual promiscuity was rampant and the whole Roman world had an expectation of men especially that they would be unfaithful as a matter of course. The Greco-Roman world is somewhat legendary for their so-called sexual freedom, but actually that was a misnomer. 
Only men in that world, in most cases, had an unaccountable self-expression sexually. Women, for the most part in that patriarchal society, were regarded as possessions. And there was a huge disparity between the rules that applied to men and then the rules that applied to women. St. Augustine, the early church father, has become somewhat legendary for his own journey and his resulting theology about se sex and self. In his confessions, Augustine conveys that he was torn between two opposing forces, sexual desire and spiritual desire. And he confronts that conflict consistently. The Apostle Paul is highlighting this exact challenge. We are spiritual beings first, we're emotional beings second, and we're physical beings third. And so we have to learn to let our spirit guide our emotions and, our, and also our physical desires. Let's talk about it in a more practical way. What's the best way to avoid sexual sin? If you're married, then plainly it's to build a lifelong, committed and joy-filled relationship of intimacy in your marriage. Contrary to the world's opinion, the best sex life isn't being experienced by those who have many different partners. The research actually shows the exact opposite. In several studies over recent decades, the devout Christian and Jewish communities who are monogamous, and by the way, monogamous, not monotonous, have been shown to have the best outcomes by up to 30% better satisfaction rate regarding sexual experience and pleasure. Why is that? I think it's because God designed intimacy to be just that, shared exclusively with one partner and for it to be a unique and private world secured by genuine and lifelong love. As I said, there's many studies that highlight that detail. And so that should give you great hope that if you're married, invest in making the sexual experience and intimacy of your marriage to be a progressive journey of joy and discovery. If you're single, then the best pathway to wholeness in this area is to understand that you are still created a sexual being. There's a need then in, in order to balance that, to keep your focus on building genuine and authentic relationships without the distractions of sexual pressure. Both Jesus and Paul had to lay aside their earthly desires for intimacy in order to pursue the kingdom of God. They both also learned to view potentially sexualized situations through the eyes of God's love rather than their earthly desire. Let's pause and think about that for a moment. You might remember the story of John chapter 8, where Jesus is there with his disciples and suddenly the Pharisees drag in a woman caught in the very act of adultery. It's fascinating to me that they bring the woman and not the man. And they throw her down at his feet and they immediately confront her and him with this question. In the law, it says that we are to stone such women. What do you say? Well, Jesus was caught in the middle of a terrible moral dilemma because if he denied the law, then he himself ought to be stoned because the law was above all. The, the law was exalted in the understanding of the whole nation of Israel. But here is this beautiful woman who was been entrapped. And to me, it's, it's an incredible moment because Jesus navigates this with a supernatural wisdom. Let's face it, he, there was no easy answer to this situation, but Jesus finds the most powerful declaration in the middle of all of this about grace and also about proper judgment. He literally says this, let the one without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. Wow. Well, right at that moment, conviction falls upon that crowd. You see it 
from the older ones first. One by one, those men, those judgmental men begin to slide away and slip out of that conversation. Because I think sometimes the eyes of Jesus were able to pierce through every human intention and motive. And, and in that moment, it's like he can see into the soul of every person surrounding him. All the judges ready to kill her are finding in the desire to kill her also a, a self-judgment because they themselves had failed sexually in one way or another. See, Jesus clothes this woman with love and grace when she was there unclothed and naked because of the hatred of a judgmental religious order. He clothes her with love and grace instead of human desire. And this was in contrast to the shameful behavior of the other men present. You see, lust sees other people as an object Lust does no good to them and it does no good to us. Whereas love sees each other person as a friend. And if you're my friend, I'm not seeking to harm you or to rob you. I'm seeking to bless you and to benefit you. Paul actually gives his son in the faith, Timothy, a way to live with this same unshakable conviction. He urged his young disciple, Timothy, to see younger women as sisters, for example, as a way of clearly avoiding any compromise in those relationships. You can find that in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 2. Treat older women as you would your mother and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. It's such a powerful thought. And there's a common thread even among some Christians that the morality being expressed here is, is somehow now out of touch and out of date, but it's not. And it, somehow they think it's impossible to fulfill. I hear this all the time from people in church. Oh, no, well, that's that, that Christian ethics on sex. Oh, I think that's just a bit of a pipe dream. I don't think it's relevant for today. Can I say this? Truth remains true whether it's convenient or comfortable or, or, or fits immediately into our current frame of reference. There's no doubt that the sexual ethics of the New Testament are a difficult expectation that all of us will struggle with at some point. But the reality is living a pure life sexually brings enormous benefits and a great sense of peace. Let's return to thinking about the journey of St. Augustine. If you're not aware of this, St. Augustine, uh, as a young man, was incredibly sexually promiscuous. He, he had many relationships. He had a concubine. He had a child by that concubine. He, he uh, was due to be married. But in the middle of all of this process, there was an incredible encounter with God where he ultimately became um, a monk, actually. Um, he founded a monastery and became one of the greatest theologians and philosophers of all of human history. He said about himself, my sin was this, that I looked for pleasure, beauty and truth, not in God, but in myself and his other creatures. And the search led me instead to pain, confusion and error. You can find that in St. Augustine's Confessions. St. Augustine discovered the power of genuine conversion. He let go of that overwhelming sense of need for sexual pleasure and replaced it with a deeper love, a spiritual love that literally became all consuming for him. And that leads me to the second point of this message. We overcome temptation with love. God has called us to live holy lives not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refused to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. We don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. Paul continues to exhort the church to live by love. You see, 
We'll never overcome sexual or any other temptations just by incredible human self-will. We only overcome lust with love. We only overcome our overwhelming desires with a better desire. We overcome addictions by replacing them with something better. Let me pause and reflect on my own journey in this space because as a young man, I was like St. Augustine. I was not a believer. I pursued sexual relationships for my own pleasure. And I can't honestly look back on any of those relationships and say that I actually loved the people that were the object of my desire. And I don't think in the end that they felt loved. Contrast that to my journey now. I've been happily married to one beautiful woman for 38 years and we love each other deeply and, and with, we've been through many things. But we've discovered in, in our intimacy as a, as a couple, we discovered something that I could never have dreamed was possible in my former relationships. So I'm living proof of the fact that this actually works. Even though I've done this imperfectly, even though I've failed, even though my motives have sometimes been impure, even though I've struggled with all sorts of temptations along the way. None of us are immune to this. We are sexual beings, whether we like it or not. We have to learn to deal with our, our actual challenges honestly and openly before God, who's not surprised by anything. He knows everything about us. So there's a safe place before God to come and honestly own what our struggles are. You know, the Apostle Paul knew what this was like because he lived a life pursuing the kingdom of God where he didn't get to be married. It was too dangerous for his wife to travel with him, so he never got married. And I think what a terrible sacrifice that was for him. But in the middle of all of that, it also became a focal point for him to focus his energy on something higher than his own desire. That higher calling was the kingdom of God. As we finish this chapter, I want to sidetrack into one other thing that the Apostle Paul exhorts us about that's relevant to the whole way we do life. My third point is simply this, overcome empty pursuits or trivial pursuits, we might say, with purpose. The Apostle Paul writes to the Thessalonians, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live and you will not need to depend on others. Beyond the issues of sexuality and, and the ethics of sex, there's another core conviction Paul wants the church to hold on to. He wants us to have a personal work ethic. There is enormous human dignity in work. Contrary to some opinions, work is not a curse or a part of the obligation of a fallen humanity. Work was actually part of the designed mandate for Adam and Eve from the very beginning of creation. He wanted Adam and Eve to care for the stewardship of the planet. He wanted them to look after the animals and the wildlife and the, the flora and fauna of our whole, of our whole planet. And that's a task I have to say, we've consistently failed to perform well. But there is great health and emotional reward in achieving outcomes through diligent labor and the development of your work skills. And Christians should also have an unshakable conviction that each one of us is accountable directly to God, which means that each one of us can basically mind our own business whenever possible and allow people to do their own journey in peace. That's one of the things I love about Hope BC. As a church, I think we are seeking to empower people to do their own life journey as well as they can to be a follower directly of Jesus and to hear God's voice personally. Whether we like it or not, the world is watching to see if our lives really are built around an unshakable foundation of faith that works. As I draw to a close, I want to read this, this uh, short thought here. With all this discussion around the topic of temptation, it's important to remind ourselves that none of us can do this perfectly. 
We all fall short in so many ways so often. That's certainly been my experience. But that's why we also hold an unshakable conviction that our lives are based not on our own strength, our own ethical capability, but on the grace of God. One of my great heroes, Bono, explains this thought this way. He said this, I would be in big trouble if karma was going to finally be my judge. I'd be in deep trouble. It doesn't excuse my mistakes, but I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sins onto the cross because I know who I am and I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity. That's what Bono from U2 said about his own faith journey. What about you today? Can I encourage you that you are never too far from the hand of God? And may you have an unshakable conviction about your own identity in God as he calls you forward in his purpose. God bless you. Hey everyone. My name is Pastor Steve, I'm from our Maitland campus. Have you ever been to one of those beautiful old churches built in the 1700s or maybe the 1600s? Maybe a European church where you walk in and just look at the splendor and magnificence of it all and can't help but think about God. There's this beautiful verse in John 2 and Jesus is actually in the synagogue. He's moved the money tenders and pushed people out because he wants the house of God to be a place of worship. And he says this crazy thing to the religious people of the day. He says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Well, the people were just astounded. What, what do you mean? You can't build this. This took many decades to build. But he wasn't actually talking about the temple. He was talking about himself as the temple. You know that God is not interested in a building. He's not interested in a sacrifice without obedience. He's actually interested in your heart. The verse continues in John 2 and it says, when Jesus had died, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he, recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken because three days later, his body was raised again. It was fulfilled. And all we have to do is believe in him, not believe in a system or believe in a building, but believe on the name of Jesus. You know, I'd like to invite you to make that decision today, to believe that Jesus is after your heart, that he actually wants to live inside of you and relate with you and be your king and be your savior. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I'd love you to follow as I say this, Jesus, I just thank you that you are interested in my heart. Jesus, I believe in you today. Come into my life. Give me your love and joy and hope and let me follow you all the days of my life. Amen. Beautiful. If you prayed that with us, please let us know. Click or put in the chat. We'd love to reach out to you and help you with next steps and congratulate you. We're going to move on to celebrate communion together. So if you can, if you've got something, got some a Milo and a biscuit or whatever you've got near you, we're going to remember Jesus. Remember the amazing man and teacher he was. Remember the death that he went to doing the Father's will. And remember that he has risen again, that he is alive, that he is with us and He is for us and He is in us. You know, the, the blood, which is represented by this juice or whatever you have, means life. Blood in our body means life. It brings life. So as we remember you, Jesus, we celebrate the life that is in you. Thank you, Jesus. And this signifies the, His body that went to the cross, was beaten, was whipped, was put into shame but was restored by the power of God and lives forever. Like we do when we call upon the name of Jesus and are saved, we live in eternity with Him. Amen. How good is it to remember Jesus? I encourage you to do this daily. Do it at home, at the dinner table, with your family. 
continue to remember what he's done for you.
Thank you so much, Pastor Bruce, for that wonderful message continuing on in our series, Unshakable Faith, Triumph in Trials. We really pray that that spoke to your heart today. And if there's anything that you want to discuss, any questions that it may have raised, yeah. our team are going to stick around in the chat after the service and they would love to connect with you and discuss that further and encourage you in your faith walk with Jesus. Generosity is part of our DNA here at Hope You See, and we would love to thank you all for your amazing gifts and giving during this time. And if you'd like to give today, just make sure to click the link in the chat or go to our website at hopeyousee.com. Oh, hold on, sorry. Oh, what's that? It's a QR code. Oh, I almost forgot. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if you want to find out more about what's happening in the life of Hope You See, make sure to scan this QR code right or there. click the link below. Come We'd on. love to hear from you and find out what's going on in your life as well. Yes, oh, that's so good. <laughs> we love you so much, church. We mm -hmm. hope you know that. You are loved, valued, and we are so excited to pronounce the blessing yes. to declare this over our days, our weeks that we're about to walk into. So, are you ready, Zoe? I'm ready, are you Here ready? Here we go, I think so. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> awesome. I pray that God, who is a source of hope, will fill us completely with joy and peace because we place our trust in Him. Then we will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we said, Amen. Amen. See you next time. <laughs>